So, um, wow, welcome. Thank you to everybody who came from so far, including our friends from China, Australia, Germany, France, Scandinavia, all over the world, um, including uh, Peter Lickberg, who apparently went from Melbourne. Where'd you go field collecting this week, Peter? He went from Melbourne to North Carolina to collect for a day and a half on his way to Dallas after coming from Sweden or Luxembourg or Norway or wherever he was at the moment. Um, so thank you to the speakers especially that helped make this the event that it is. And for those who don't know or haven't been to these before, we've worked all year on coordinating the talks uh, to give you what I hope is a really enjoyable day. Please keep in mind that we're recording this for distribution. We print 5,000 DVDs, and most of those go to the Mineralogical Record as a donation. They go to every subscriber of the Mineralogical Record. So thousands of people will see these or email for an online down downloadable link if they threw away their DVD players already. Um, so it does go out to a crowd, so please keep that in mind. Speaking of which, I will even turn my phone off, and those who know me know that pains me greatly. Um, so please keep in mind that we are videoing. Uh, our videographer is Brian Swoboda, who is there working diligently, and uh, he gets that done for us. Thank you, Brian. And he's done that for eight years, so he has all the archival DVDs and the bloopers and offshoots. Um, but don't ask for those. <laughs> That's Brian. Um, I want to thank the Eisenman family, uh, who are also mineral collectors, for helping us to get into this wonderful facility and uh, reserve it for the day. Thank you. Uh, Brian, Charles, I believe you're here. Thank you. I want to thank Dave Wilbur just because he's Dave. Dave, thank you for coming out. <laughs> um, Dave hopped a flight and came here to celebrate with us again. Uh, I want to thank my own team. Uh, I, I could not even imagine doing this. And we started on a small scale. Uh, even then, I needed help. So thank you to my entire team. Uh, most of whom you met last night, especially Kevin Brown, who took care of the gallery, and Monica Kitt, who planned this and made today uh, structurally possible. Thank you to everyone who works with me. And I want to thank all of our sponsors, so some of whom are here. So uh, particularly, I want to note the Perot Museum here in Dallas is under new leadership. And for those who haven't met her yet, uh, Linda Silver, our new CEO, is here, as well as our new curator, formerly of the Smithsonian, Kimberly Wagner. And if you don't get a chance to meet them today, they will be around this evening as well. So thanks to the Perot. We're also supported by Heritage Auctions, represented here by Craig Kissick. Craig, somewhere in the audience. So thank you, Heritage. Um, Lipscomb Insurance Agency, and I will talk more about that at the dinner event tonight. We have structured an insurance policy, particularly for mineral specimens as an asset class, uh, that's very favorable for those of us who need to insure. And I will introduce them tonight, uh, and they will have an uh, exhibit table with some of their insurance materials. And lastly, I want to thank the University of Texas at Dallas. That's our academic sponsor. And uh, Bob Stern is here representing the university. There's Bob. Thank you. And uh, finally, just because so many of them are here, I, I want to I want to give a special thank you to um, my Midwest mentors who kind of started me down this crazy path without knowing. Um, I think it's been a few years since I embarrassed you in doing so, Sandy. So thank you to you and your wife for selling me my first $12 Wolfenite when I was 11, um, when I should have been spending the money on the Miss Pac-Man arcade games two stores down from your rock shop. Sandy's from Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I shortly after met Marie and Terry Heising, the editors of Rocks and Minerals. I see you. And I want to take this opportunity for us all to wish them a happy 57th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so 
so 57 years of collecting minerals together too. Um, and I want to thank uh, Marshall Sussman, who used to be in the Midwest, who was also one of my very early mentors and helped uh, lead to this. So thank you to all you Ohioans down here. Okay, so um, we'll just go through the talks and then we'll have a lunch break. One brief change to announce. Uh, Dr. Pagano, uh, most of you know Renato, uh, just got out of the hospital. He is fine. He is recovering in Milan, but it's a very long plane trip and a back brace. So uh, Federico Pezzada flew in from Milan to give the talk in his place as curator of the Milan Museum and probably the world's other expert on sulfurs besides Renato. Federico was the next logical speaker. Thank you, Federico, for basically planning your trip last week to come give us the talk. And we're actually going to move that talk to the afternoon. So the 11.40 a.m. talk will be Alain Marteau with the French fluorites and mining talk. We're just switching the two around. And lastly, before I introduce the first speaker, I just wanted to say a word about how the idea for this particular symposium year came about. Most of our years, we're doing a, um, uh, a mix of talks that show the synergies and, and the symbiosis between gem mining specimen mining between the gem world, the mineral world, and um, more adventure stories and how these things are coming out in contemporary times, how they come from the mines to market. This year's a little bit different with the, the more focused look at the history of mineral collecting. And this idea actually came up back in 2011 when I started talking with Wendell Wilson at the Mineralogical Record about doing a book on my China collection. Uh, that would be a teaching book I could use in China to teach them why Westerners liked such small things and why we showed so much appreciation for small crystals um, culturally and historically in our museums, and that didn't seem to be a function in Eastern cultures, India, Korea, Japan, or China. And um, a lot, I have to say, a lot of this is, is then Wendell's ideas following up. And it led to an introductory article he wrote for our book in 2013 on the crystal heritage of China. And we reprinted part of his introduction here in the packet for you so he could show you where this thinking came from. And what we got to wondering was if the history of mineral collecting, of mineral collectors, of a culture of appreciating minerals and crystals as special objects, perhaps led in some, some ways to the Industrial Revolution happening in the West the way it did, to the origins of materials science, to the origins of research in material science. Um, you just wonder how many young people were inspired by museums in, our, in the Western world to become scientists. Uh, we're fortunate to have curators today from the Paris School of Mines and the British Museum of Natural History who will share some of that history with us. And in thinking about it, the logical progression of those ideas related to mineral collectors is look how far we've come. You'll see in some of the talks today that this used to be really just the sport of royalty, uh, a sport of nobility, and we're just mortals. So this sport that we do, this hobby, this asset that we collect, 200 years ago was for kings and princes doing the grand tour of Europe, and now we're, nor we're normal people building collections worthy of museums. And I know my museum curator friends here are saying, yep, and someday you'll go away and they'll end up in our museums. Um, and, and that is the way of it. That is the way of it. Over hundreds of years, a lot of our treasures do end up in our museums where they inspire a new generation. And I think that's a very romantic idea. Uh, that's also part of the sales pitch for my consulting work in China, where they're building museums. Uh, and for those not aware of it, they have issued a directive to build 200 new museums of nature and science. And in particular, uh, we are promoting in China what we now call the Perot Museum model. So for those who made our kickoff party before the symposium at the Perot or who have been there, you understand what I'm saying. Presenting minerals as beautiful, inspiring works of art as the gateway drug to science, to learning, uh, even to a part of a culture of a country uh, is very important. And we basically are saying that this, this style we've developed in Dallas of putting our collections on loan and making a beautiful museum exhibit in an art gallery format is a new way forward. And the Chinese government has agreed and is building museums um, 
more or less to some degrees imitating the Perot Hall. So before I introduce our first speaker, I want to end this with one story about the benefits of mineral collecting a few hundred years ago. My first big deal as a mineral dealer was dealing with the Russians, but that's a long story. My first legitimate big deal was, <laughs> was uh, <clears throat> getting a tip that Herb Aboda had already been to England. Where are you, Herb? Herb had already been to England and, of course, knew this was coming ahead of time and um, got into a collection that went into storage in 1811 with one of these multi-generational ancestry laws where you could seal a room and not look at it for a couple generations and you don't have to pay taxes. And it, it was the collection of Sir Robert Ferguson of Kirkcaldy. And what I was told was, well, Herb already got all the good stuff, but it's fascinating material, 200-year-old labels with labels from counts and countesses and princes, and there's still lots of little stuff left in the drawers. It might be good for the internet. This was 1998, and this was the uh, first business joint venture I made with my good friend John Vivart, who unfortunately left us this year. So uh, John and I <laughs> bought this not knowing how it would work out, and we bought 800 pieces from the Robert Ferguson collection with these beautiful old labels, and that was actually the first big collection deaccession on the internet. In doing so, we got into his journals and his files that were stored with the family all these years, and we found uh, a quote that I'm going to read to you. So between 1795 and 1805, Robert Ferguson visited continental Europe. He met and corresponded with many famous scientists. Switzerland, Dresden, France. Well, unfortunately, he was in Paris when Napoleon came to power. And um, Napoleon didn't quite know what to do with this guy. So he put him in Montmartre under the care of Jacques Ch uh, Cuvier, the great biologist. Because Ferguson was British nobility, you had to watch him. But he seemed to be a scientist, or at least talk like a scientist. He was just collecting minerals. He wasn't really a scientist, but he talked the talk. And so um, here's this quote uh, from Sir Joseph Banks, who wrote to the French, uh, I think the French Minister of the Interior, on January 30th, 1804. There is among the English detained in France a young gentleman, Mr. Robert Ferguson, whose pursuits are very much directed to scientific objects. He is not yet a fellow of the Royal Society, but will certainly be chosen into that body as soon as he can return home, if his liberty could be obtained. It would be considered a favor here to all scientific men and a great compliment to the Royal Society of Britain. So it just goes to show you that collecting minerals can have unexpected benefits in politics then and now. I, I've just always found that story fascinating and we found that letter lost in his archives. So Herb, thank you for leaving me some crumbs. Appreciate that. <laughs> he says he still got some things after I was done.